Order members, it is time now for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Mr Deputy Speaker, considering the importance we place on ensuring that uh, all victims and survivors have an appropriate representative voice through the Commissioner, we want to ensure that we have the right person for the job. The current process produced a disappointingly small pool of appointable candidates. We have therefore agreed to try and widen the pool through a new competition. In the interim, the Commission is continuing to deliver its work plan uh, this year and is working with the Victims Forum on ensuring victims and survivors' interests remain at the forefront of our actions. I call Joe Byrne for supplementary. Thank the First Minister for an answer. I think it is disappointing to know that a Victims Commissioner has not yet been appointed. Can the First Minister confirm when he hopes that an appointment will be made and what relationship will there be in relation to the Victims Forum as agreed in the Stormont House proposals? Well, I agree with the, the member. It is disappointing, but I think it, it is important that we do get the right person for the job uh, and ensure that uh, they have the best possible representation uh, and someone that they can work with and uh, who can easily work with them. Uh, from, from our point of view, we will look over the uh, next number of days uh, to see uh, whether uh, a further advertisement, maybe more widely advertised than previously, whether there is a case for reconsidering the level of remuneration. Uh, as I understand it, the Children's Commissioner uh, is uh, remunerated at a higher level than was offered for the Victims Commissioner. Uh, and uh, maybe look at uh, relocation costs and those kind of issues to see if that brings in a larger pool of candidates. I call David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the First Minister for his answer so far. Uh, First Minister, just touching uh, maybe a little bit on, on, on what you just said, maybe ask you to elaborate a little bit as to what could be done um, to make this post more attractive, given um, that for quite a high-profile position there was a, a relatively low uh, number of candidates. Well, those are some of the, the things that, that, that can be done. Uh, I think we do need to remember that. Uh, uh, victims have been given a very high priority uh, since devolution. We have, in fact, uh, increased uh, by a multiple of four the amount of funding that has gone to uh, victims uh, since direct rule. Uh, and indeed, uh, in the, the budget that uh, my, my friend uh, announced to the House earlier today, it will give the highest annual level ever uh, for victims' uh, funding, and I think that's uh, important. That indicates the, the importance that it is considered to be as far as the executive is concerned. It is uh, right that we ensure that we do get the very best person for the, the job. Uh, perhaps we need to significantly increase the uh, advertising uh, that uh, goes on to, to try and attract uh, a wider range of people for the job. I call Chris Hazard. Good. Well, last can call you and thank the Minister for his answer uh, this far. Uh, and, and on the importance of appointing a commissioner, I really want to push the Minister on a time frame which you think this appointment can be made. Gormio Good. Well, as uh, officials are looking to reshape the conditions around the, the, the job, I suspect that will take uh, a number of days. Then we go out for advertisement after that. Then you're into uh, the uh, the, the business of uh, carrying out the, the interviews and then the uh, appointment. Uh, we, were, we are considering, um, though this is something very much that the Deputy First Minister and I would take as a second best option, we do have the, the, the option of putting in an interim commissioner uh, if that was felt to, to be helpful, uh, and that will depend largely on what officials tell us the time frame would be for having a commissioner in place. I call John Dallet. Uh, question number two. Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask my colleague, Junior Minister Jonathan Bell, to answer this question. Together, building a united community <clears throat> includes a commitment to establish an Equality and Good Relations Commission that will act as an independent, statutorily based organisation to provide the policy advice and a challenge to government. The establishment of this Commission will not constitute a merger between the Equality Commission 
and the Community Relations Council. Instead, the primary legislation will add specified statutory duties in relation to good relations to the powers of the existing Equality Commission, creating a new Equality and Good Relations Commission. These new powers are outlined in the Together Building a United Community Strategy. Some of these duties currently reside with the Community Relations Council, but without a statutory basis. The draft bill is under active consideration within the department. Once the bill is agreed, we intend to initiate a 12-week public consultation on the draft bill and its associated documentation. In advance of the enactment of the legislation, departmental officials are working with both the Equality Commission and the Community Relations Council to consider the extent to which the aims and the objectives of together building a united community strategy can be delivered by these respective organisations within their existing varies and within their existing remits. I call John Dallat. Deputy Speaker, I'm sure there's many people outside this House who will be listening very carefully to the response of the, the Minister, believing that these are core principles of the very foundations of this Assembly. What assurances can the Minister give us that the uh, work of the Equality, Permit, Equality Commission will be ring-fenced and protected in the future, and that the work of the Community Relations Council is not diminished? Well, the, the assurances are the assurances that we have already given. The, both of these bodies uh, have their own uh, powers and remits and varies uh, and uh, their own uh, authorities. Um, in terms of the future, um, you know, as I say, the establishment of the new commission doesn't constitute a merger between the Equality Commission and the Community Relations Council. It's proposed the Equality Commission will take on the additional responsibilities uh, in terms of good relations, and I hope that reassures uh, the member. Uh, as some of those responsibilities relate to the work that's currently under the remit of the Community Relations Council. Uh, we have the Transition Board uh, drawing its membership from both of the organisations. And uh, as the new Commission will take on some of the functions that are currently being undertaken by the Community Relations Council, the Council will continue to have the responsibility for the funding. So, therefore, it will not cease to exist uh, as an independent organisation as a result of this legislation. In addition to this, the Community Relations Council is classified as a non-departmental public body, but it also exists as an independent company and a registered charity, and therefore any decisions uh, regarding its future uh, would be made by its board. I call Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the junior minister if additional resources have been allocated <coughs> or obtained for next year to support the actions under the TBOC strategy? Yes, well, I'm grateful to uh, the excellent work that the Finance Minister uh, has done uh, already uh, this morning and has announced uh, to the House. Um, that additional resource will allow us to take forward uh, much of the work uh, that's already ongoing in the pipeline right across the uh, seven headline actions. And I get particularly encouraged when I see some of that work, not necessarily just around the, uh, the urban villages and the, the summer uh, programs, but the work particularly with our young people uh, that's bringing the young people together, uh, allowing them to learn new skills together, particularly the additional resources that were given to the Department of Employment and Learning, to, which will underline bringing young people together, young people who are not in education, employment or training, and what better way for young people to come together than to learn new skills together that will give them prospects of jobs and hope. And many of us know when we listen to the youth service and many of the other voluntary agencies regarding young people, that when we give a young person an opportunity of skills that leads them into a proper job, their relationships improve, their family relationships improve, their addictions in the past 
where there has been the chemical dependency, the alcohol dependency, the drug dependency, all of those decreases and the additional resources, particularly in the Dell, gives us a real sense of hope that we can bring people together that haven't been together before and shape an entirely new future, but one that is prosperous for everyone. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Another key aim of the Building United Community Strategy is to increase the extent to which our children and young people are educated together. How concerned then is the Minister by news that the Department of Education surrendered around £5 million allocated uh, for this Building United Community Strategy aim? Well, I think under the Stormont House Agreement, uh, and I had the privilege of taking part of, in some of those pieces of work, uh, and uh, seeing the agreement of your party right up until it appeared to, to vote on it, and then they appeared to vote against it, um, that those additional resources to education that were put through this morning against the votes of your own party uh, will bring more young people together than would have been the case otherwise. It will bring them together in a way that they can share and learn and experience where previously they weren't there before. So that additional uh, money that has come into the budget this morning, in addition to not making sure those classroom assistants and those teachers, and I'm a governor of a school that was looking at potentially up to 10 teacher redundancies uh, in Newton Ards, the additional money into education, which you voted against, and I emphasize that, which you voted against, will ensure that more children get educated together and more children share together. And it's not my difficulty, if it's on your conscience, that that additional funding to secure teaching jobs and bringing children together was actually voted against by your own party. I call Bronwyn McGahan. Good. Uh, I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Minister, would you agree that equality must be paramount in, in any proposed legislation? Well, yes. I mean, we have uh, been consistent uh, in our approach uh, in terms of that, and I see there's no reason to deviate from that. Uh, we have looked at the legislation, and we have uh, agreed it here, and it's really uh, over. Uh, to yourselves uh, and others to bring back your agreement on that particular piece of legislation. Moving on, I call Colm Eastwood. Three, please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with uh, your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. The issue of clerical abuse is no less important, uh, nor is it no less emotive than that of institutional abuse. And I want to say that we are mindful of the equally destructive impact that it, it has had uh, on those individuals. In the latter part of last year, we tasked our own officials with developing an options paper relating to the clerical abuse that falls outside of the scope of the inquiry into historical institutional abuse. Uh, we are now in receipt of that options paper. Uh, as part of the consideration of options, we are giving considerable thought to the likely needs of the victims of clerical abuse, particularly around emotional uh, and other support. But ultimately, it's going to be for the executive to consider how to deal with clerical abuse that does not fall within the inquiry's terms of reference. We cannot speculate now uh, about the need or desirability for redress in advance of that executive uh, looking at the situation. But can I say that anyone who experiences of abuse fall outside the scope of the current inquiry is encouraged to report this directly to the Police Service of Northern Ireland and the Social Services for Investigation. Because where appropriate, the alleged perpetrators can be brought before the courts, and that's the primary means by which victims and survivors can seek justice for what occurred to them. I call Colin Eastwood. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, can I ask him specifically around the, the Hart Inquiry? And, uh, we know now that the Hart Inquiry has been extended. We also know that a, a number of 
victims, quite a lot of victims have come forward saying that they would like to see the issue of redress in terms of the heart inquiry uh, to be accelerated. Uh, has the Minister got any view uh, as to whether a scoping exercise at the very least could be commenced uh, to look at the issue of redress to ensure that people get uh, what they're entitled to before it's too late? Well, I, I am aware the members put uh, sort of two issues there, uh, one in relation to the situation uh, with the one-year extension, which the member correctly uh, notes that uh, following the first uh, module of the inquiry's public hearings, the inquiry chairperson made a persuasive and a very compelling case to use uh, a one-year extension to the inquiry time frame. Now, just to let me put some accuracy into the question. One three all section of the inquiry into Historical Institutional Abuse Act, Northern Ireland 2013, allows the First and Deputy First Minister acting jointly to amend the terms of reference of the inquiry uh, by order that after consulting the chairperson, if a draft of the order has been led before and approved by resolution of the Assembly. So just to uh, afford the member that uh, we have, uh, we hope to see the draft order being debated in the chamber uh, in the next number of weeks. In relation to um, the situation of redress, I want, do want to quote, we were very fortunate to get a distinguished uh, judge uh, to chair the inquiry, and that's what we wanted for victims and survivors, to have somebody with that level of expertise. And what he said, uh, and I quote him directly, until the inquiry completes its work, it's not likely to be in a position to make any recommendations uh, because that would be arriving at a decision before we have heard all of the relevant evidence. And I would not like to commit myself even to saying that we would look at producing interim recommendations because that would be the same, uh, that would be subject to the same inhibition. Now, those are the words uh, of, the, of Justice Hart, who is chairing the inquiry, and I think we do well uh, to uh, follow those. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The, the Minister will be aware of the ruling by Justice Tracy with regard to uh, the JR, the Judicial Review on the Non-Provision of Legal Representation. Uh, turning to the application for the grant of legal representation at public expense, at point 34 it says, please explain the nature of the public interest that will be served by an award being made for public funds. See rule 21 brackets 2 brackets B of the inquiry rules. Would the minister accept that, that this rule is actually something of a catch-22 because for a vulnerable victim to answer such a complex question, they actually would need expert legal advice in the first place? I have to say that uh, I did note with uh, a level of... Uh, I was very disappointed with the decision that Justice Tracy made. When we spoke and we went north, south, east and west, uh, and listen to victims and survivors. Um, they asked us that the, in many cases, that the legislation be set up, and it was set up, to minimize excessive legal costs. And it's important to emphasize that that was done largely at the request of victims and survivors. And the legislation gives the chairman the discretion to listen to cases for independent legal advice, and we are content uh, with that. The decision that the member refers to uh, may make the inquiry very legalistic and costs could get significantly out of control. And I have to say that this may even jeopardize, it may even jeopardize the, the inquiry, the entire inquiry, as it would quadruple the costs potentially could quadruple the, cost, the costs of the inquiry and jeopardise the inquiry itself. Uh, the Chair is appealing the judgment. I don't want to comment any further on this aspect in light of the fact that the Chairman is uh, appealing the judgment. But given the seriousness of what I have just said, I want to make it also very clear that I'm very supportive of the appeal of the Chair. Moving on, I call William Irwin. Four, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. 
The needs of victims uh, and survivors uh, are important, and through the work of the Commission for Victims and Survivors, we continue uh, to ensure that they have uh, proper representation and a collective voice. Indeed, in going forward, acknowledging and addressing the suffering of victims as part of the transition to long-term peace and stability is one of the key issues that is considered within the current political architecture. The Commission regularly liaises with victims and survivors through the Victims and Survivors Forum to discuss the shared experiences of dealing with uh, and of acknowledging the past. As a result of these discussions, the Commission has submitted an advice paper uh, on dealing with the past. I call William Irwin. Can I thank the junior minister for his reply? Can the junior minister confirm what budget has been secured for victims uh, in next year? Well, I think as the uh, first minister alluded to earlier, uh, the excellent work that the finance minister has managed to secure in place uh, for the, the victim service. Uh, and now, in the region of £13 uh, million, pounds, when we look at where we were in 2007, we look at where we were uh, under uh, the previous uh, set of arrangements. And we're now, I was always very proud to say, up to this point, that we had tripled for victims and survivors the amount of uh, funding that they received for essential and key services that are provided to them. And I've had the privilege of going to visit many of the groups and seeing many of the uh, from physiotherapy uh, right through to uh, individual support, uh, right through to uh, group supports, the needs that victims and survivors had, and they must never be forgotten, and their needs must never be forgotten. And I was always pleased to say that from the position that we inherited, uh, we tripled that funding. But as the First Minister said earlier, that has now been almost quadrupled. And I think that shows the level of commitment that we have uh, to victims and survivors. And yes, we acknowledge too that more people are coming forward, and we have sought more people uh, to come forward. We don't want people uh, suffering uh, on their own or in isolation. But we have quadrupled the amount of money in one of the tightest set of uh, financial circumstances that anyone in this House has had to deal with. And I think that shows that victims and survivors remain for us a priority and addressing their needs will always be to the forefront of our own considerations. I call Jim Allister. Do the Minister agree that key to uh, satisfying innocent victims is addressing and reversing the obnoxious definition which equates them with victim makers? And can he tell the House, is it correct that no progress was made on that matter in the Stormont House Agreement? I can't say that many victims have uh, raised that uh, issue with us, and uh, as this House knows, it's a position uh, that, that we support. And uh, in fact, many on these benches have brought forward, both uh, in this chamber and are potentially doing it at, in other uh, chambers, the need uh, and to look at and address the definition uh, of a victim. But as the member equally knows, uh, that is something that under the current set of circumstances that we have inherited, that we have to gain agreement on, and we will seek to work hard with those victims and survivors groups. And I have been to the west of the province, and more recently I was in the south of the province when it was raised with me, and I shared with them what we were intending and would like to do in relation to that, and how we were trying to seek the necessary agreement and consensus to take that forward. I call Alex Atwood. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, as the junior minister has said, uh, victims and survivors have to be a priority. In that regard, are you in a position to share with the House any fresh thinking that might be developing in relation to the management of inquests, in particular dealing with the issues of disclosure, the backlog? and the resourcing of inquests in order to ensure that those victims and survivors who seek out truth are given that opportunity? Well, 
As the member would know, uh, so I've been in discussions with him, both uh, in terms of the Stormont House Agreement uh, and also in previous uh, iterations, uh, going back to Haas, that we have sought uh, on each of those matters to progress them uh, in the best way that we possibly can. It's my understanding that the party leaders of all of the parties will be meeting uh, later on today, um, at a later stage, uh, to see where they can seek to get consensus to advance those matters uh, specifically. Moving on, I call Tom Elliott. Uh, question number five, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, discussions in relation to the creation of a body equivalent to the OBR took place during the talks which led to the Stormont House Agreement, but did not form part of the final agreement. While the matter remains under consideration, given the more limited financial responsibilities of Stormont and Westminster, a clear case has not yet been made for the establishment of such a body. The difficulties faced in managing finances have been created not by a lack of information about the consequences of decisions, but the challenges of re reaching political agreement. We believe that the budget agreed by the Executive last Thursday and uh, implemented implementation of the Stormont House Agreement will put our finances on a stable, long-term footing. I call Tom Elliott. Uh, thank the First uh, Minister for, for his response. And obviously, I'm keen to assess maybe the uh, view or, or the opinion of the First and Deputy First Minister's office uh, on the, the position. And uh, does he actually believe that it would be helpful especially in some of those departments where uh, there is a suggestion that the management of the finances may not be appropriate? Well, <laughs> the, it is very brave of the, the, the member uh, to make those comments, given that uh, the only uh, finger that was being pointed by the finance minister this morning was against his own uh, minister for the mismanagement of uh, his departmental uh, finances. Uh, however, I think we do need to remember the OBR is set in a national context, uh, dealing with uh, tax regimes, uh, dealing with uh, welfare uh, payments, those kind of uh, issues, uh, looking at the performance of uh, government in, in relation to the wider uh, economy. Uh, we, we don't exactly fit in that uh, category. And it's not as if we're short of getting advice on uh, financial matters. And in many ways, to put a body such as the OBR uh, in place in Northern Ireland uh, indicates to me that members don't have much confidence in their role because it is the role of this House to be looking at the finances, to be challenging the Minister where necessary. It's the role of the committee set up by this House to do precisely that. Uh, and uh, those who are looking for that kind of institution to be placed in Northern Ireland seem to be saying they're not capable of doing their own job. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Would the First Minister agree that rather than further analysis or additional uh, new bodies, that what is really required is parties actually taking difficult decisions uh, rather than playing party politics and providing no credible alternatives? Yes, the, the only occasion when we've been knocked off course in terms of uh, our financial management has related to issues uh, around welfare reform. Uh, it was the, the penalties and the costs uh, in relation to that that uh, knocked us off uh, course and caused the, the difficulty that we had uh, in the, the previous months. We have now resolved those issues. There is a five-party agreement on welfare reform, uh, and therefore I don't look to seeing any problem with that uh, in the, the future. And yes, what is required is some political courage uh, by parties who, in one place, uh, appear before the Secretary of State indicating how they are going to, to work to resolve all of these financial issues. But when the first hurdle appears before them of passing a, a budget and taking difficult decisions, they all run away uh, and go into the no camp. I call Dominic Bradley. Um, could I ask the um, First Minister if he would agree with me that a Westminster-style uh, public accounts committee would add considerably to the scrutiny of public expenditure here? Well, I, I think the, the member would need to tell me in what way 
he feels uh, our Public Accounts Committee is deficient in carrying out its duties, given the prominent role of some members of his party in it. And that is the end, end of time that we have allocated for listed questions, and we now turn to topical questions. And I now call Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the First Minister, uh, does the failure of three of the executive parties uh, to support the budget amount to a rejection uh, by them uh, of the Stormont House Agreement? Well, I, I hope uh, it doesn't, I have to say to, to my colleague. Uh, indeed, uh, we had a, a meeting, if I can recall, on Monday of uh, last week when uh, all of the five executive party leaders uh, confirmed that uh, they wanted to, to work towards implementing that uh, agreement and meetings are now set up uh, to work towards the implementation uh, of the, the agreement. Uh, of course, I think it is worth pointing out that there were, in effect, two agreements, uh, although only one has been published. Uh, there was a second agreement, which was the Stormont Castle Agreement, when all of the five party leaders and their teams agreed to a uh, financial package, uh, which included welfare reform, which included the reform uh, of uh, the public services, and which included a range of budgetary issues. Uh, and the five party leaders went to the Secretary of State uh, to show that we were prepared to take those hard decisions that were necessary in order to get our finances on a stable, sustainable and long-term uh, basis. Sad to say that uh, not all of the parties who were on that delegation uh, were able to uh, give the degree of support that was necessary when the, the first issue came before them, namely the, uh, the passing of a, a, a budget. But uh, I, I hope that they'll get themselves uh, into order uh, and they will recognize the obligation that they have uh, to implement those ma uh, elements of the agreement. Because as I sat at uh, Stormont House, I didn't hear anybody around the table saying that they rejected the, uh, the agreement. Uh, I recognize that there are some who would choose to use it as an a la carte menu, pick the bits that they, they like and leave the hard decisions for the two larger parties to, to take. But that isn't uh, giving leadership and it's certainly not very responsible. I call Jimmy Spratt for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the First Minister uh, for that answer? And is the First Minister content with the new arrangements uh, for welfare reform? Uh, and does it avoid the costs of, from computerisation that were assessed going to cost uh, hundreds of millions of pounds each year on top of the uh, annual penalties that uh, the DWP uh, were insisting would be paid? Uh, and would have grown, uh, I think, in the last estimate I heard, to some £350 million. Pounds. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I did indicate that there was a five-party uh, agreement to a range of uh, financial matters, one of which uh, included uh, the changes that would be necessary to the welfare system. Uh, because all five parties signed up to the detailed uh, proposals that were contained within that document, I'm confident that we will be able to move forward uh, on a united basis on the, the welfare changes. Therefore, uh, as that is based on the, using the DWP computer systems, uh, that uh, there will be no additional costs uh, to have our own IT system. There will be some added costs for the uh, enhancements that are contained uh, within our system, which will require some refinement of uh, IT programs, but that is very small uh, in terms of the, the major change in costs that there would have been if we had to have our own system. In terms of penalties, my understanding is that the penalties will cease as soon as this House has passed the legislation and uh, regulations, so there would be no further cost once we pass that mark. I call Sammy Wilson. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Deputy Speaker. Uh, in the days and weeks, <laughs> that's the extent of my French, by the way, uh, in the days and weeks before the Stormont House Agreement, civic leaders and trade unionists lectured politicians in this chamber about the need to show courage and the two. Can we have a question, please? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm coming to the question. Would the First Minister agree with me that now that the trade unions are leading an unprincipled, emotional and inaccurate 
campaign against the agreement that it is they who are not showing leadership and indeed following a narrow agenda which is not good for the economy of Northern Ireland. Well, I, I'm sure that uh, many of the, the party leaders uh, in this House uh, will have uh, received representation uh, in the run-up to the Stormont House uh, agreement and during it uh, from uh, church and civic leaders, uh, including representatives of the, the trade unions, uh, telling us that uh, it was our responsibility uh, to be prepared to compromise, to make accommodation uh, for others. Uh, and it is sad to see that uh, when the uh, Make It Work campaign, uh, which uh, I have to say I agreed to the, the principles behind it, uh, when it uh, went to such lengths uh, as it did <coughs> in launching that uh, campaign, that as soon as the, the parties reach agreement in talks, that it is one of their member organisations uh, who comes out uh, with the most outrageous statements in relation to the, uh, the agreement. Uh, that is not uh, leadership, uh, which was what they were saying that people needed to show uh, in order to reach agreement uh, in Northern Ireland. Indeed, I have to say it shows uh, a very uh, poor knowledge of economic principles and facts uh, if one is to consider the content of that uh, advertisement. I call Sammy Wilson for a supplementary. Four, four years ago, when the current budget was introduced, the same trade unions were, were predicting that 50,000 public sector workers would be thrown out onto the dole. Uh, that didn't happen. Would the First Minister confirm that any redundancies which will take place as a result of the Stormont House Agreement will be purely of a voluntary basis and not, as the trade unions have suggested, throwing workers out of work when they wish to stay in work? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have to say, if one was to read their advertisement, we would not see that uh, it was uh, a voluntary exit scheme that was being proposed. But here is a sentence from it. Thousands of sacked public servants will face the UK's lowest wages. Sacked civil servants. It is a downright lie from the pit. Uh, there is no sacking of civil servants uh, under this proposal. It is a voluntary exit scheme, voluntary being the, the key uh, word in it. Uh, and uh, I suspect that it will be their members who will be volunteering to be part of that uh, exit scheme. Uh, and for them then to go on in their advertisement uh, to say no one voted for our elected politicians to do a deal like this. Well, let me tell them that uh, as far as I'm concerned, I did get a mandate to seek powers for corporation tax powers to be given to Northern Ireland. I did get a mandate to reform the public uh, services. I did get a mandate to rebalance the economy in Northern Ireland. And I got a mandate to deal with welfare reform. How dare the trade unions tell me what my manifesto and my policy documents were? We sought a mandate, we got a mandate, we implemented that mandate. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the First and indeed the Deputy First Minister, given their support for organ donation and specifically the move to a soft opt out system, whether they have, since our meeting last March, met with the new Health Minister to relay their support for a soft opt out system? Well, we, we haven't uh, met with the new uh, Health Minister on that subject, but as uh, the uh, new Health Minister is a very intelligent and uh, well-read individual. He will know of our support uh, for that uh, proposal. Uh, and uh, as I understand it, uh, the uh, member has a, a bill which is working its way uh, through the, the, the House, and I've made clear my intention to support it when it comes to the Chamber. I call Joanne Dobson. Can I thank the First Minister for his response? And given, um, as he has outlined again today, their joint public support for the soft opt-out system and today's earlier budget announcement on health, have, has the First and Deputy First Minister pressed for any additional resources to enable the Health Minister to move to be in a position to introduce the new system? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the allocations in the, the budget give a total of 204 uh, million pounds additional to the health service, but obviously it is for the health minister uh, who is in day-to-day -day contact with the pressures and priorities that he has to meet 
to determine how that should be allocated. I call Stephen Mitry. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In light of the recent commitment in the Stormont House Agreement to reduce the number of government departments, can the First Minister indicate whether that work has commenced, when it will be completed, and what can the public expect to see from it? Uh, yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, it has uh, more than commenced. Uh, indeed, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I uh, had asked the uh, head of the Civil Service, who is the Permanent Secretary of our Department, to work up some options, which he had done even before the Stormont House uh, Agreement. Uh, he uh, has produced a, a paper which the Deputy First Minister and I shared with executive colleagues at the last uh, executive meeting, uh, which uh, gives a, a favoured uh, option, though there are still some issues to be clarified uh, in it. Uh, the uh, executive colleagues were asked uh, to come back, I think, by tomorrow uh, with uh, any uh, support or any proposals that they might have in terms of uh, amending that, uh, that document. I, I would hope that if we can make sufficient progress, we might even uh, get it on to uh, a special executive meeting uh, this week. If not, uh, it will be on the uh, agenda for uh, next week's uh, uh, executive meeting. I call Stephen Mitry for supplementary. Thank the First Minister for his response. And can the First Minister inform the House why we have to wait until 2021 to see a reduction in the size of this Assembly? Well, I, I suppose the answer to, to that is that we don't. Uh, have to wait until 2021. Uh, the Stormont House uh, agreement, carefully worded as it was, indicated that uh, any change in the, the numbers to, to 90 uh, should take place in time for the 2021 uh, election. That doesn't say that uh, it couldn't uh, take uh, place for the 2016 uh, election, because, of course, by doing it for 2016, it would be in time for the 2021 uh, election uh, as well. Uh, all it requires is uh, agreement. I know that uh, the Alliance Party and the Democratic Unionist Party supported uh, going straight uh, in, 2020, uh, in 2016 uh, to, to 90 seats. Indeed, my party believed that it should be 72 seats. Uh, we have already between two and three times the number of elected representatives uh, in Northern Ireland per head of population uh, as they do uh, in Scotland. So I think there's good cause to see a uh, reduction. Uh, however, there was not agreement uh, from uh, the other parties, though I, I trust in the, the, the days, weeks uh, and months ahead, uh, people will consider the pressure uh, on public finances uh, and look at uh, this as being one mechanism where we can show that we are prepared to take pain as well. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the First Minister why uh, the programme for government commitment to extend age, discrimina uh, age discrimination legislation to the provision of goods, facilities and services has yet to be delivered or even realistically talked about? Well, I will ask my colleague uh, John Bell to, to answer that question. Well, the, the commitment uh, was given uh, at that particular uh, time and we continue to be and uh, my most recent meetings was with many uh, members of the age sector as we continue to try to put uh, in place a system that has agreement to achieve what we set out to achieve, which would be that there would be uh, no discrimination in terms of goods, uh, facilities or service. I mean, it is absolutely wrong for people just because they have crossed a certain age and are in good physical health to have, for example, their travel insurance just tripled. In cases that I've been speaking with uh, many of our elderly citizens, uh, the, the cost of the travel insurance has now meant that they can't get a holiday. In fact, the cost of the travel insurance in some cases is almost where the cost of the actual uh, holiday is. And I think we're all agreed in this House, and we're all uh, working extremely hard. I know Junior Minister McCann and myself, our advisors, uh, in our last meeting just at the very end of the last year, we're working with the uh, age sector particularly uh, to see how we could get this through uh, within this particular mandate. And that is the end to allocate it time to questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister.